Let's go to him in prayer now. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you did pay it all. And Father, we, we're about to uh, look at a portion of, of the scripture that you've given us, Lord, where we, we get to um, listen in on an intimate and private conversation between you and your Father. And Father, there's no way that we can comprehend or understand or grasp the, the magnitude of the suffering, of, the, of the, the battle of the will between the human nature of your Son and your, and your plan for all of redemption. There's no way we can comprehend that without the power and the help of your spirit. We pray, Father, that you would prepare hearts and minds. You'd get me out of the way. And that you, you would show us yourself, Lord. And that we would be changed by what we see. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You can all be thankful that I did not sing that last song. So good evening, everyone. This evening we'll be looking at Mark chapter 14, verses 32 through 42. A very familiar passage. This is a passage of Jesus wrestling in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the Bible, the Bible begins in Genesis with a very similar story of a garden. The Garden of Eden. Where the first Adam encountered the temptation and allurement of Satan. And he lost that battle. And as a result of that failure by the first Adam, God pronounced over the serpent in Genesis 3.15, he said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. And he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And in our studies on Sunday mornings upstairs, we've been going through the book of Genesis, and we've seen this pronouncement play out through the course of history. We've seen the consequences of the failures of the first Adam. And all of those consequences, all of the death and misery of sin is the backdrop that leads us to what we're looking at tonight. The second, second and last Adam in another garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. Again, he encounters the hostility and the allurement of Satan. And yet he emerges victorious in order, of course, that he might bring his brothers and sisters, those received into his family by the spirit of adoption, that he might bring his brothers and sisters into a new garden city, described for us in the closing chapters of the book of Revelation. This, of course, is the final evening of Jesus' earthly ministry. He just came from the upper room where he has instituted the Lord's Supper, and in the institution of the Lord's Supper, he uttered these words. This cup is my blood, shed or poured out for many. And those words that come from the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, one of the servant songs of the prophet, describing the role and ministry of the servant of, servant of the Lord, the Messiah. And one has to imagine how Jesus, as a young boy, heard from the scriptures, perhaps read to him by Mary and Joseph, the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. And as Jesus grew from boyhood to teenager, to a young man to adulthood, and as he contemplated more and more what the task of the ministry of the Lord's servant would entail, that it would entail the pouring out of his life, the shedding of his blood. And as he, and he has, in his public ministry, made it very clear to the disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and there be betrayed into the hands of sinners, and there to be handed over to Pilate, and on the third day, crucified. And now here in this narrative, Jesus has gone from the upper room down to the Kidron Valley into the Garden of Gethsemane. And the Gospel writers seem to, to tell us that he did this on every evening of this final week as he spends this final week in Jerusalem, a pattern that would have been known to, G to Judas. Judas has now left the scene. He's gone to collect his 30 pieces of silver, he has betrayed Jesus into the hands of the high priests and Roman guards and authorities. 
And Jesus now comes into this garden with the 11 disciples with him. And as we will see, a battle is taking place here. A storm is brewing here. From the relative calm of the upper room, we descend now into what is a storm that is brewing in the Garden of Gethsemane. The battle, and it's a battle for submission, the submission of the mind and the will and volition of Jesus to the task that the, his Heavenly Father has commissioned him to do. And that submission takes place not so much on a hill called Calvary, but in a valley called Gethsemane. And tonight, I want us for a few moments to leave behind the stresses and the cares and concerns of home and family and employment and a thousand other concerns that we bring with us. And for a few moments, I want us to focus on Jesus. I want us to look full into his wonderful face. That the things of earth might grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I want us to see something of what it cost the Lord Jesus. I want us to see the struggle that he went through in the Garden of, of Gethsemane. So will you stand as we read the word of God for us tonight? Mark 14, verses 32 to 42. This is the word of God. And they went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little further, he fell on the ground and he prayed that, if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came, and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into t temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away, and he prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy. And they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour, the hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hand, hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Amen. This is God's word. You may be seated. There's this verse from a well-known hymn that I find particularly relevant this evening as we devote our attention to this unique event. The hymn writer cries out the following refrain. Oh, make me understand it. Help me to take it in. What it meant to thee, the Holy One, to bear away my sin. And that is the main crux of the message this evening. What did it mean to the Holy One, Jesus? What did it mean to him to bear away our sin? I believe that by observing the Savior in the Garden of Gethsemane and overhearing him pray, we, dis we discover what it meant to him, the Holy One, to bear away our sin. I think this passage uniquely reveals what it meant to him. Here in the Garden of Gethsemane, we are informed by him what it meant to him to bear away our sin. And this, this is what it meant to him. It meant resolving to endure God's wrath for our sin through the experience of human weakness. That's what it meant to him. It meant resolving in this garden to endure, to experience God's righteous and furious wrath against our sin and for our sin through the experience, through the crucible of human weakness. The Savior's humanity is uniquely described and displayed in, this, in Gethsemane. Here we uniquely encounter his human, humanity. The Savior, let me remind you of his humanity just for a moment and the importance of the incarnation because I don't think we can fully appreciate this passage unless we're aware of his humanity. Through the mystery of the incarnation, God the Son became man. We read in 1 Timothy 3.16 that the preexistent one was manifested in the flesh. He laid aside his glory, not his deity, but his glory. He laid aside his glory to become a man in order to be the mediator between God and man. He was truly God, 
and fully human. Only one who was truly God and fully human could be the mediator between God and man. And only Jesus Christ was and is truly God and fully human. And here, here in the garden, we encounter him as fully human, sinless, but fully human. And we observe of the Savior and, and his humanity in the garden. What we hear from the Savior and his praying in this garden is, it's, it's, really, pre, it's really foreign to, to any previous description of the Savior. We overhear the Savior communicate how he was, he was very sorrowful, even unto death. His soul is described here as greatly distressed, greatly distressed and troubled. That description of the Savior, this experience of the Savior in the garden is, it's foreign to anything we read about the Savior previously. Throughout the New Testament, the Savior has been forgiving sin. He's been healing the sick. He's been casting out demons. He's been raising the dead. He's been walking on water. He's been calming storms. He's been feeding thousands. He has been boldly confronting the religious authorities. He's been compassionate. He has been authoritative. And he's been fearless. But in the Garden of Gethsemane, everything changes. A dramatic change occurs in the Garden of Gethsemane. Here in the Garden, we encounter a Savior we're unfamiliar with. We're unfamiliar with the Savior as he describes his soul is very sorrowful. As we read words about him being really greatly distressed and troubled of soul. And here in this garden, we discover what it meant to him, the Holy One, to bear our sin. Here, his humanity is distinctly and uniquely revealed to us. He contemplates God's wrath that he's about to encounter on the cross. And he resolves to endure God's wrath through the experience of human weakness. So we're just going to consider for a moment what it meant to him to endure and to experience God's wrath for our sin through the experience of sinless humanity and human weakness. So what did, it, what did the agony of Gethsemane mean to our Savior? It meant relational abandonment. Relational abandonment. Abandonment beginning with Gethsemane and, and then continuing throughout his arrest, trial, and crucifixion. The Savior is abandoned and the Savior is alone. He's abandoned and he's alone, and Mark wants us to be, to be aware of this. Mark wants us to be affected by this. And so in verse 27, we're informed that the Savior informs and prepares the disciples with the following statement. Jesus said to them, you will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. So in verse 27, the Savior informs them, you will, you will all fall away. That's followed by Peter, James, and John falling asleep as he's praying in the garden. And this culminates in verse 50 where we read, and they all left him and fled. So this is very intentional. This is very purposeful. Mark wants us to, wants to draw our attention to this. You will all fall away. They all fall asleep as he prayed. And then verse 50, they all left him and fled. And notice, notice the description of how the disciples are placed in verses 32 and 33. Because Jesus stations the eight, and then he stations the three. And then he goes a little further, as though, as though visually, it's like a military formation. So you get the sense here that he's almost stationing his troops like a general might. But this is no ordinary battle. This is a spiritual battle. Satan's, Satan's abroad, you understand, He's already gained the heart of Judas at this point. And Jesus is stationing his troops. But there's one thing that only he can do. He alone is the savior. He alone is the mediator. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. It's though a visual clue is being given to us that he alone can bear the sins of his people. He alone can bear the guilt and burden of sin. He alone can die in the stead of sinners. He alone can propitiate our sins and bring us to the Father. He alone is the mediator. So I want you to see him praying, and I want you to see him isolated. And I want you to see him in a spiritual battle. So what did it mean to him, the Holy One, to bear away our sin? This is what it meant. 
It meant that he would bear our sin and walk this path from Gethsemane to Calvary alone. He would not have the support of his disciples. He would not have the support of his friends. He would walk this path alone. They will all fall away. They all fell asleep. And when he was arrested, they all left him and fled. He will walk this road alone. That's what it means. That's what it meant to him. He was abandoned. He was alone. I think we often feel alone, right? Don't we? But the Savior didn't just feel alone. He was alone. He didn't simply feel abandoned. He was abandoned. And so for him, the experience of human weakness or the crucible of human weakness involved relational abandonment. They all fell asleep. They all left him and fled. This is what it meant to him, the Holy One, to bear away our sin, beginning in the garden and continuing to the holy hill called Calvary. He would walk through the entire horrific process, abandoned and alone. That's what it meant to him. Secondly, it meant distress of soul. What did it mean for him to bear our sin? It involved distress of soul. And let's, let's consider this carefully. We want to spend a few moments here, a few unhurried moments contemplating this event. And I want to draw your attention again to verse 33. It says, And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. He began to be not just distressed and troubled. He began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And then verse 34, And he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful. And note the final three words, even to death. In this moment, in this garden, at this time, he's drawing near to the actual experience of death. At this moment, prior to the crucifixion, in the garden, that's how sorrowful. So sorrowful, he describes sorrow as even to death. One translation reads that he was gripped by a shuddering terror. A shuddering terror. And at this point, I think it would be helpful for Sinclair Ferguson to take our hand and describe for us what's taking place here. Sinclair Ferguson wrote of the Garden of Gethsemane the following. Quote, The Garden of Gethsemane is one of the most sacred and solemn scenes in the entire Bible. Such was the intensity of Jesus' experience there that Luke, the physician, recorded that Jesus' sweat was like drops of blood. At the end of the experience, an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. Alexander Witt, the famous Scottish minister in the 19th century, once said with insight that in heaven, after he had seen Christ himself, he would like his first conversation to be with this angel. Who knows what depths of suffering this angel came to witness? End quote. So why this extreme distress of soul? Why? Because there's no previous indication, there's not even a hint prior to this moment of this distress of soul. So why this all of a sudden extreme distress of soul? I mean, if we just back up to verse 22 at the Last Supper, there's no indication there at the Last Supper of this distress. In verses 22 and 23, we hear the Savior giving thanks. He's giving thanks. And in verse 26, he concludes in leading them and singing a hymn. So had you been present there during the Last Supper, you would have observed him giving thanks, and then the time would have concluded with the Savior himself leading everyone in singing a hymn. Again, there's no discernible distress in his soul at this point. But in the Garden of Gethsemane, everything changes. Everything changes immediately, and everything dramatically changes because in the Garden, he's deeply distressed. He's troubled. He's overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Why? It wasn't as if he, his impending death was a surprise to him. He was aware of his death from the outset of his ministry. He had informed his disciples of his death throughout his ministry. He had sought to prepare his disciples for his death throughout his ministry. He repeatedly made reference to the hour which was fast approaching. The Savior did not find himself in the garden suddenly surprised that he was going to die as a substitutionary sacrifice for sinners like you and me. This was no surprise to him. 
So why? Why so abruptly? Why so suddenly? Why so dramatically is there this distress of soul? Here's why. In the garden, the Holy One begins to experience a foretaste of what it means to be the sin bearer. That's what's taking place in the garden. That's why this dramatic distress of soul. The revulsion of it to be reckoned a sinner. Because he's about to be reckoned the greatest sinner the world has ever seen. And every fiber of his being is revolted. And in the garden, the Savior is contemplating the cup. He's contemplating the cup. And he's contemplating the contents of the cup. It's the cup that's dominating his heart and mind. And as he prays in Gethsemane, and so we need to ask, what is this cup? It's dominating his heart and mind. What is this cup? Well, Isaiah would inform us that this cup is the cup of his wrath. It's the cup of God's wrath. He's contemplating God's wrath. He's contemplating God's righteous and furious wrath against sin. That's what he's contemplating. And as he gazes into this cup, he's brought face to face with this horrific reality of bearing our sins and becoming the object of the Father's righteous and furious wrath on the cross. In this prospect of experiencing God's furious and righteous wrath is so horrific, so horrific, he, he cannot remain upright. He, Mark informs us, fell to the ground. He's pressed down to the ground. He's so overwhelmed. He's so greatly troubled. He's so distressed, even to the point of death, that he cannot remain standing. He, in effect, falls to the ground. And this prospect is so, so horrific that he prays. He prays, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. He stares into this cup, and in his sinless humanity, he's so affected by the horrific reality of God's wrath and becoming an object of God's wrath that he prays. He prays for an alternative to the cross. In his commentary on the Gospel of Mark, William Lane writes the following of this prayer in this moment. Quote, The dreadful sorrow and anxiety then, out of which the prayer for the passing of the cup springs, is not an expression of fear before a dark destiny, nor a shrinking from the prospect of physical suffering and death. It is rather the horror of the one who lives wholly for the Father at the prospect of the alienation from God, which entailed in the judgment upon which Jesus assumes. This horror thus anticipates the cry of dereliction in Mark 15. Jesus came to be with the Father for an interlude before his betrayal but found hell rather than heaven opened up before him, and he staggered, end quote. He staggered. He didn't sin, but he staggered. And as he contemplated this horrific prospect of hanging and not simply suspended between heaven and earth, not simply experiencing the unimaginable physical pain of crucifixion, no, he staggered as he contemplated being the subject of God's righteous and furious wrath against sin, And as he looked in that cup and he contemplated that horrific pending reality, he staggered. See, on the cross, he anticipated and would experience not not simply relational abandonment. He would experience being abandoned by his father as well. Without in any way severing the mystery and the unity of the Trinity, he would be abandoned by his father on the cross. You see, in this moment, he's really contemplating the ultimate agony of Calvary. And we'll never understand Calvary apart from understanding Gethsemane. Gethsemane really is preparation for Calvary. And Gethsemane interprets Calvary for us. And here in his humanity, we overhear him praying for an alternative. My soul is greatly troubled in distress. My soul is sorrowful, even to the point of death. Abba, Father, all things are possible with you. Is there an alternative to this? If there is one, would you provide it? He finishes that interaction. He goes, think of it, what a savior. In that moment, he remains concerned 
for Peter, James, and John. He knows the great temptation awaits them. He knows they are prepared for it. He finds them asleep. He exhorts them to watch and pray. He then returns and prays the same words, the same words, Abba, Father, all things are possible with you. Would there be an alternative to this? And as he appeals to the Father for an alternative, this is what he hears. Listen. This is what he hears. He's listening. He's anticipating some response. And this is what he hears. Silence. Now let me assure you that if there was an alternative, the Father would have intervened and provided an alternative. If an alternative existed, the Father would have immediately responded, immediately intervened, and immediately provided an alternative. But there was no alternative. God so loved the world that he was silent when his son appealed for an alternative to the cross. But now look. Look at our amazing Savior's resolve. Look at verse 42. The verb at the very end of our passage in verse 42 says, rise, let us be going. The verb rise, many commentators seem to point out that the verb is actually taken from the field of battle. It's rising for battle. Here is the captain of our salvation, and he's riding forth into battle. He's spoiling principalities and powers, making triumph over them in the cross. He's commanding them as captain of their salvation to arise. I want us to park here for just a moment on this amazing resolve of our Savior in Gethsemane. There's something moving, something truly inspiring when we see someone respond with resolve to do what they were purposed to do. And we can come up with examples, and I'll just have one, and it pales in comparison to what we're talking about here in the Garden of Gethsemane. For those of you that are old enough, is it, does anyone recall the, the phrase, let's roll? Right? 9-11. Todd Beamer and several other guys are in one of those hijacked planes. And he's been on the phone with his wife, and his, the wife overhears what's going on in the plane. And they're scheming to take down the hijackers. hijackers. And the last thing Todd Beamer's wife hears is, let's roll. Right? There's something inspiring about that. There's something moving about someone resolving to do what they were purposed to do. That pales in comparison to what we're talking about here. Let's not just fly by this resolve that we see from our Savior in Gethsemane. This is Jesus in his human capacity, feeling the weight of the task at hand. He's come for an appointed task. He's come for a specific mission. He had come to do the work of the mediator, and, and, and the time had now arrived. The emotional and the psychological state of the incarnate Lord he is, he's troubled, he's distressed, he's, he's on the verge of being unhinged. He has this sorrow which, which paralyzes him. It's a sorrow that's on to death. And some of you here may know a little something of that, a sorrow, a state of psych, psychological paralysis, and, and you can't move. You don't want to get out of bed in the morning. You don't have the energy. You don't have the resolve to do what needs to be done. It's a sorrow that leads to sorrow that's on to death. It's almost un unhinging him. And you need to hold your breath here because this is what he asked for. Let this cup pass for me. Let it pass. And you realize that our salvation is in the balance here. You understand that? Our salvation, our well-being, our fellowship with the Father, the fact that we're here this evening, that we're Christians, that we've been adopted into God's household and, and the family by, into his family by the grace of God, that we're heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. All of that is in the balance here. And our Savior responds with resolve. 
with certainty. Rise. What did it mean for him, the Holy One, to bear away our sin? Well, it meant first, relational abandonment, and second, it meant distress of soul. So now, in our remaining moments before the Lord's table, I think it would be appropriate for us to ask, what does it mean for us? What does the agony of Gethsemane mean for us? And one thing it means is for us to recognize his love for you in his darkest hour. See, in his darkest hour, his love for you is on full display, and it's wonderfully revealed to us. Because see, Gethsemane is to be reminded, is, is to be a reminder of our own sin. Here in this garden, I am reminded of the serious and appalling nature of my sin. We cannot seriously look at Gethsemane and emerge unaffected by his love for sinners like you and me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Listen, when we see those words in verse 36, you are looking at the greatest display of obedience in all of history. Listen, he, he drank the cup. Just before entering Gethsemane, he gave the disciples a cup and had them drink and told them, this is my blood shed for you. He then goes to Gethsemane and he takes another cup, the cup of God's wrath. The cup he agrees to drink in Gethsemane is the cup that we should drink. That's the cup we should drink. That's my cup. That's your cup. He takes that cup from us and he says, this is the punishment you deserve for your sins. I'm going to take that cup and I'm going to drink that cup. And I'm going to exhaust the content of that cup. And I'm going to give you a cup that you don't deserve. I'm going to give you the cup which symbolizes my shed blood for the forgiveness of all your sins and satisfaction of of God's righteous wrath against your sins so that you might know the forgiveness of sins and freedom from fear of future wrath. That's what's going on here. It's amazing grace. See this. Recognize his love for you in in his darkest moment. He exhausted the cup of wrath you deserve so that you can experience a cup of blessing. Secondly, receive his care for you in your darkest hour. Dark hours for for the Christian are inevitable. Dark hours of temptation and testing and trial and suffering are inevitable for each and every one of us. All one has to do is live long enough and you'll encounter a dark hour. But listen, you will derive immeasurable benefit from an accurate understanding of this passage in your darkest hour. And it will make all the difference in experiencing and receiving his care for you in your darkest hour. I have no doubt that some in this room tonight are presently in the dark hour of a trial or suffering. And I believe this message, this passage, the Savior wants, shows us that the Savior wants to comfort you. Comfort you in a way that only the Savior can in your darkest hour. And he can comfort us because he can sympathize with us like no one else can. That's why we read in Hebrews 4, verses 15 and 16, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in a time of need. So if you are in a season of suffering, that is the invitation from the Savior, that you do not have a Savior who cannot sympathize with your sufferings. No, you have a Savior who has suffered in a way that you will never be able to comprehend even throughout all of eternity. He is capable of uniquely comforting you in your darkest hour, and he invites you to come to this throne made of grace where he is able to sympathize with you and provide mercy and grace you need in your time of need because of what he experienced in the Garden of Gethsemane. So, what did it mean to him, the Holy One, to bear away our sin? It meant resolving to endure God's righteous wrath through the experience of human weakness. What did it mean to him? It meant he was abandoned and alone. It meant he was distressed of soul even to the point of death. That's what it meant to him. What did it mean to us? This is what it means to us. 
receive his love for you, evident and on full display in his darkest hour, and receive his care for you in your darkest hour. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just, we love you, Lord, and um, a message, a passage like this, Lord, the reality of seeing the Savior distressed, alone, and yet obey, obeying you in your will. I don't think we can, we can't wrap our arms around that without your spirit helping us, Lord. We just pray that this passage would be sealed into our minds and hearts, and because of it, Lord, we would receive your care for us in our darkest hour. Help us now, Lord, as we prepare to partake in the bread and this cup of blessing. Help our hearts and minds to be focused on you and what you've done for us in the Garden of Gethsemane in bending your will to the will of the Father. And on Calvary, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So now...